All right, here we are, another episode of The Grail. Fantastic guest. Introduce yourself, my man. I'm Josiah Citrin, Chef Josiah Citrin, Chef Owner, Citrin Hospitality, which includes Malise Restaurant, Citrin, Charcoal Venice and Charcoal Sunset, Dear James and Dear John's, as well as Augie's on Main. Yeah, just a just a fucking king of the uh restaurant world. <laughs> It ended up that way. Not, I don't know how that happened, but not exactly by choice, but somehow I got just all it, happened. It's interesting. Oh, first of all, you got some uh, Jacques Marie Mages on there. So shout out to that. Always. Always. Yeah. yeah, right. Johnny, I just I just got these. So they're great. Yeah, they're the cash, Johnny Cash. Oh, yeah, the cash. Yeah, the cash. How many pairs you got? I have uh, four. Four pairs that I I adjust them all, turn them into transition, progressive. That's what I wear all day long, in and out, and all day. I love them. I'm the same way, man. I had Jerome on and uh, years ago, and it's just amazing to think about where uh, his company is now. It's like a cult following. Yeah, he's an interesting. His story was interesting. Coming here from France, and then I looked it up when I found the glasses. Working for all the like, you know, sports, whatever, exports or snowboarding. I think it was Skull Candy and Burton, right? Did he do that? Yeah, yeah. It's just wild, right? And then, but this started and it didn't do very well, Jack Marimage. It was kind of like floating out there. No one knew. And then it just caught on like fire. Yeah, it's interesting because I got them years ago. And, you know, I happened to walk into Fred Siegel and they had like five pairs. And they go, I go, oh, what's this? And they go, that's a new brand. And I immediately put it on and I was like, well, these are insane because there was that whole, uh, you know, maybe a 15 year period where no one was doing anything with eyewear. It was just ridiculously stale. And then here yeah. comes this guy. And not only does he come out of the gate, you know, in the last five years, he's probably released like a couple hundred styles and they've all been home runs. Yeah. And then the packaging's nice. Everything's nice on him. Yeah, man, it's it, it's uh, interesting to see in this day and age where everybody cuts corners and doesn't care about anything that he really goes the extra mile, you know, and and it kind of um, when I met you, it reminded me of like your food and your restaurant, you had went the extra mile, everything in there, the furniture, the food, the silver, everything was perfect when I was in there. And I was like, it's it's really really rare to see that these days somebody going the extra mile yeah that's the whole idea right take it the extra mile push a little harder keep trying to get better in pursuit of excellence it's always what we're fighting for right we're striving for i gotta tell you man uh i grew up in the bay area san francisco and when i first moved to la it was really tough to kind of find some good food coming from San Francisco, you know, it's just the food level in San Fran was so beyond to me that it was really hard to adjust for a little while. But it seems to me in the last 15 years or so, LA has really caught up and uh, has really, you know, taken off in the culinary world. I would agree. San Francisco was mystical for so many years. It had I mean, all the farms and all the stuff near it. It had that whole vibe, that Chez Panisse kind of vibe that started. And all those chefs that left there and kind of had that farm to table going on. But LA, we always had kind of a different situation. We always had like that, you know, uh, much more um, ethnic, different, you know, kind of foods here. We've always had that. Plus, we had some good restaurants, but it wasn't like San Francisco. It wasn't so many places popping up. It's also a big spread out city, so it's hard to find all these places. It's not like you walk around the corner, there's one great restaurant to another great restaurant. And I think being an LA native, something people forget is that when you go to San Francisco and New York, there's one-way streets everywhere. And so you're on a one-way street and you go past that same restaurant every day or that same, and you see those restaurants, you remember those restaurants, you know them. Here, there's a million ways to get around the city and you cannot go past that one restaurant for the next 10 years. You know, our streets are much more user-friendly, I guess, not being one way. Yeah. It, it also has to uh, 
really be by a strong word of mouth if you can't get any press. And that's really what you're relying on. People going like, oh, you got to go to this restaurant, you know? Yeah, that's the best. Anyway, word of mouth is always the best way. Absolutely. Now, what really blows my mind, you're the first chef I've ever had on and you own your restaurants. That has got to be the toughest game I've ever seen. And I'm a comedian. I think it's harder than being a comedian. You know, people think that's like the hardest thing as far as like, you know, grinding and struggling. But I just look around at restaurants for the last 20 years and think, how do these places make money? You know, I mean, I really do not understand it. It's definitely not easy. I mean, you kind of, it's, I mean, it's like you can lose a, in a month. You have a great month. You make a little money. You have a bad month. You lose a lot. You lose a lot of money. And, you know, being in Los Angeles, we've always been pretty lucky, like a little insulated to some of the recessions and everything because we have Hollywood except for we get in situations like now where we have an actor strike and a writer strike. And all of a sudden you realize how much that drives this town and how much it affects it. And always people are like, Oh, what do you mean? The actors, they really go to your restaurant that much. Are the writers? No, people don't realize that the whole industry is shut. That means anybody who has anything to do with that industry is not going out to eat right now or very little. I mean, obviously, the top 5% or 10%, yes, they always have money. But the rest of the 90% of people that work in Hollywood are really on a budget, you know? So it's been tough right now in this time. But, you know, we grind it out. We do it. I think you get in this, the kind of restaurants I run are more, it's not from a business sense you get into it. It's a passion. It's I got into it from being a chef and not wanting to have to deal with asshole owners. So that's how I ended up owning my own restaurants. Uh, other restaurants start off from a business, you know, they go to people go to business school, hospitality business school. They said they want to order, open a concept. They do it strictly as a business. Mine is a passion project that I had to learn how to make money so I can keep the passion project going. I was pretty blown away to think about uh, years ago. I don't know if you saw that documentary on uh, Chef Gordon, you know, where basically people like Wolfgang Puck, and these chefs were basically making like no money at all for these restaurants. And then he came around and kind of created this, uh, you know, the chef, the TV shows and and to get these people paid and stuff. Was that uh, a case when you first started out? Because you've been in the biz like over 25 years, right? Yeah, almost. I'm getting close to 30, starting 86, so... I'm nearing 40 years now, 86, 96, wow. 16. Yeah, I'm nearing 40 years doing this. Um, long time. Uh, I mean, look, chefs have always, I mean, certain chefs along the way have always done well. They have Michelin three stars or but other cooks never made money. But definitely, you know, as it goes, it started with Paul Bocuse, who's really the first chef to kind of taking the chef out of the kitchen and making the chef a celebrity. The old saying used to be, they're gonna if a if the house is burning, they'd save the dog before the chef. That was the old saying back in the old days. But um, now definitely it's gone. But definitely like as chefs went on and started doing TV, Gordon Ramsay he really changed in the way that he became producing the shows, and he really understood it and got it and kind of ran with it even more, which is incredible. Also, because here you have a chef who also has three Michelin star restaurants. It's very not normal to have a chef who's TV and three Michelin stars. But when you're around him, he's amazing. And just his whole energy and how he so quick, so sharp and the energy level he has, like it's like five humans energy level. I just remember early on <laughs> Spago's the one uh, on the, the little Spago's on the, yeah, the, on the horn. Sunset and horn. Yep. And early days of Wolfgang and then of course uh, I'll never forget the day I was watching um, Letterman and here comes Bourdain with Kitchen Confidentials. He comes on and he does an interview and I'm like, whoa, this guy's like an outlaw, man. He's into good music. And uh, I read the book. I'm not even, I'm not even into that. I just bought the book because I love the dude. 
And next thing you know, I'm taking the ride and and trying all of these incredible restaurants over the last probably 25 years of, of traveling around. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, these characters were kind of outlaws, like you are a heavy uh, music freak. You dress uh, cool. You know, when I saw you right away, I was like, oh, this guy is one of those cool chefs. You know, it, it's wild. I think that a lot, of, you know, I think it's art, it's artistry. It's a lot, you know, sort of outlaws. I mean, I mean, I think Anthony Bourdain, he went to, you know, good schools, everything, but he got, you know, he came from a, well, you know, a pretty good family. He's a great storyteller, right? So that's what he can install everybody to love this. And that's what his great, uh, his great addition was. He could tell these stories and make everybody want to go in all these places and love these restaurants and this different food. It's a great, you know, knack to have what he had. Um, and he came on the scene. Yeah, he was a rebel, a pirate, you know, like all kitchens. Like when you're in a kitchen, it's not it's not normal life, right? You work when other people have fun, you know, and it's a high stress life. We all think it's the end of the world, even though it's just food, right? We're cooking food. We're not saving lives. But to the customers, the guests, you think we're like saving their life sometimes. Like if they wait 10 minutes longer for their meat, they're like pissed off, like, acting like oh they're back there fucking around the kitchen or they're out having a cigarette bag well we're working our ass off and the stress blow of the kitchen you know you get off late at night so if you go out for a drink when most people are having a drink at six o'clock to eight o'clock you're having a drink from 11 30 to two and you know nothing good happens after two <laughs> so unfortunately you know it's just kind of your life and then get up and start all over again especially when you're just a cook you're just a cook you go back to work about one o'clock so you know, you get time to sleep in, your day gets going, and it's just kind of a never-ending tumbleweed. But yeah, it's kind. Of, I think chefs are kind of, you know, interesting. You get into this chaotic business because you have some kind of chaos, or you're drawn to chaos. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Well, I th most chefs I know they 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 like to do a little drinking, and uh, you know, and they they'll fly off the handle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, and you're like, Whoa. but as you mature on, you get a little more used to it. Like, you know, you start off when you're like, when you start off, you're nuts and you just want to conquer the world and be the best. And then as you get older, you realize, okay, I'm still here. Nothing really happened. I don't know if I need to fly off the handle like this so quite much. Yeah. And plus, this, this new generation of youngsters, they don't really appreciate that too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. They'll they'll uh, report you. <laughs> yep, that's the new world. They'll report you. Yeah, they're, they're snitches. These kids, they're snitches. <laughs> yep, not good. Yeah. So, basically, what happens? You 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 grow up in Santa Monica. You're uh, L.A. born and raised, and then yep. you you go out to Paris to uh, Culinary Academy. What happens? No, basically, I grew up surfing out here, hanging out, Dogtown, Santa Monica, Venice. Uh, surfing and I, my mom had a little catering company and she'd do a lot of catering out of the house. So, you know, I had to make a couple bucks to go on surf trips. So I'd help her. Then it came around time to kind of like figure out what, what I'm going to do with my life. So I'll, I'll be a chef. I had no idea what I was getting into. Talked to a bunch of chefs in LA. Should I go to school? Should I get a job? They also get a job. So I got a job at a West, at the West beach cafe it was a pretty hot restaurant in Venice back in the day. We're talking 1986. So, you know, at that time, there's a lot of drugs in these restaurants. And I'd worked there for six and a half months. Everybody's partying, staying up all night. Like, I don't know if I'm going to actually do great here in learning. I don't know how I'm going to learn to be great here. So I decided to move to France. At the time, my dad is French, was living there and doing gray market bands and Converse and Levi's. Wow. He was kind of selling on the gray market. So I moved to France and got a job. I said, I'm going to go for one year when I was 18 and a half. And I ended up staying for three years, had the time of my life. I mean, who wouldn't have a good time in Paris when you're, say, 18 and a half to 21? I mean, first I could drink there legally. I couldn't even drink here. So, but no, it was a great time living there and experiencing Paris, a city that was so amazing, especially in the late 80s. And then you come back and you start working for different restaurants. Is that what happens? Yeah, I came back and I started working for Wolfgang Puck at Chinois Maine. 
couple years, then did a couple years at Joaquin Special and Patina Group, Patina Restaurant. Then I went on my own with my partner, Raphael, my best friend from childhood. We opened a restaurant in 96 called Giraffe on Fifth and Santa Monica, which was there for 20 years. But wow. I left in 1999 and I opened Melise in 1999. And now, you know, it's been 24 years and uh, life's gone by. Happens just like that. It's insane, right? I mean, some, yeah, of, that, some of that food you were serving me, I couldn't even tell you what it was. You know, it was just coming out because I was there for the, um, I guess. It was like, what's that? It's like the pre-Michelin party. I think right. it was like. Right. And uh, you were just bringing out all this different food. And it is incredible to think about when I was a kid, I wouldn't eat shit, man. I was into cereal, grilled cheese sandwiches and barbecue, you know? Nothing wrong with that, though. Those are three good things. Those are the greatest, right? But as yeah. I got older, I started just trying stuff. And now I'll pretty much eat anything except for maybe sea urchin, you know? I mean, I'm I not mean like a born aid, born aid, uh lunacy of like eating, you know, pig balls and shit like that. But, you know. I'm pretty sure you ate sea urchin that night, though. <laughs> I know I did. I was like, I still hate it. <laughs> you have that crunchy little one bite sea urchin dish. So, yeah, but yeah, I immediately was like, oh, that's some sea urchin. <laughs> yeah, sea urchin is one of those things that the taste can put people off or it's kind of like cilantro. You either yeah. love it or you hate it. When you start your restaurant here on your own, I mean, it had to be a fortune just to start about, just to think the rent alone is crazy in LA, right? Yeah, I mean, fortunately, I started back in 1999. It wasn't as crazy as now. Right. But I kind of had time to build into it. I mean, the rent here was eleven thousand dollars when I started. You know, <laughs> now it's only twenty. It's not that bad. It didn't go up twenty-one, but it didn't even double over twenty-four years. So it's not horrible. At the Melise and Levinson Wilshire, but I have some other ones I pay some steep rent at. Yeah, yeah. Now your restaurant, it's two restaurants, really. Yes, it's two restaurants. Yeah, so, explain that to people. So originally when we opened in 1999, the whole restaurant was Melise. It was a very fine dining restaurant with white tablecloths, you know, your traditional French style restaurant. Then for the 20th anniversary, I decided to re gut the whole place and create two restaurants in one, two different entrances. They do share a bathroom. So I made Melise a small five table intimate restaurant where the kitchen's in the dining room and it's kind of one together. Um, you know, you know, we have fine tables, everything's fine, like you stated there. We even have a beautiful Macintosh uh sound system, wonderful speakers, and we play albums, and the albums are always played beginning to end. Very rarely do we do greatest hits albums because we want I want to have what the artist created in the album as we create the menu, kind of like you know, they put the first track on for a reason, the last track should have a reason to the album. So we kind of play the whole album from beginning to end, whatever it is, slow songs, fast songs. Um, you know, that was Melise. It's, a ten, it's like a 15 to 16 quart bite menu. And then we have the rest of the restaurant became Citrin, which had some of the, like, some of the old signature dishes from Melise. So we don't do any of the new signature dishes. We don't do any signature dishes from Melise in the new Melise. We have those in Citrin, a few of them, plus a lot of new dishes. <clears throat> Citrus a la carte menu, has a big bar, um, a lot more, almost, it's not as fancy, a little more casual, but still a nice restaurant for a nice time. Uh, so Melise has two Michelin stars and Citrin has one Michelin star. So it's a good feeling to have three stars, but not exactly three stars, three yeah. stars per se. I went to that Michelin star event uh, and you were, you were there and I had never seen anything like this. And the pressure of that has got to be insane of each year uh, holding on to your Michelin star or gaining a third or a second Michelin star. The room, the room felt like I, I've never felt the tension like that in a room ever where people were just in there biting their nails and they would say new Michelin star restaurant, note sushi. And it was just like, ah, and people were going yeah, and, and so other people, 
other people would lose their stars. It was like, I didn't even know. That's the thing is once you get it, once you lose it, it's bad. Yeah. Right. And I have other restaurants that people are like, oh, don't you want to get a Michelin star there? I said, no, I have enough pressure with the two restaurants that have stars. I don't want to have, you know, Michelin stars in every restaurant. So if you lose a star, do you feel that the restaurant community, the customers go, he lost a star, the restaurant is slacking now? Do they, do they really, does it get out like that? I don't. I think so. I think it definitely gets harder to have business, especially tourism. And the business in Michelin draws a lot of tourism and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. That that is that is insane, man. You know, do you remember it, the first it's thing? Stress just thinking about it right now. I do. I could feel you, man. I could feel you. I was in it, there with you guys and I was like, oh, this is awful. <laughs> you know, like, oh, awful. oh, yeah. Every year. When the guy comes out, you know it's starting to come out that month when they start asking you some questions or you know it's coming out. You just till it comes out, you're like, or basically till you get the invitation to the party. You're like, shit, am I gonna if you don't get the invitation, you're screwed. It means you oh. lost it. You're not invited. Oh, oh shit. So, so that's the, you're waiting for that invitation, you know? And every year. So this happens every year, that one month before it. Like shit. And you have one sigh of relief the night of the party. You figure, hey, we're good tonight. <laughs> and nothing could go wrong. <laughs> and after that, it's like, yeah. How does it work? Do they do they um come in and secretly eat, or do they say, Hey, we're coming in, we want some uh try some food and make sure you're still at the Michelin star level? How does that work? It's secret. You don't have any idea when they come. We don't know. There's no rhyme or reason. Wow, it's like secret shopper stuff, man. Exactly, completely. Now, is it strictly on the food or is it also on the service and presentation and all of that? I mean, Michigan said it's strictly on the food, but it all is an experience. So they might not judge the service, but the service affects your experience with the food. So right. it's about everything. It's about the presentation. It's the whole shebang. Do you remember when you got your first Michelin star? What, how, I mean, what was that like? You had to be, in, you know, incredibly happy. It was amazing. Well, this was back in 2007 with a 2008 guy, the first time they came to LA. But somehow, a few of us figured, like, we were all so nervous hearing the Michelin guides coming, and you're like, oh, shit. I'm just hoping to get a star. And then there was this thing, and then, it's like, oh, and then, like, the New York guy came out, the LA guy came out, and then looking in the UR line, the UR line and on the website, you know, www.com Michelin stars slash New York. And then click on the one for, said the same thing for San Francisco. Let's give this a try. Type in Los Angeles, up it pops. It was already on the website, but it hadn't been released. Oh, whole scandal. Everybody found out before, saw the two stars, like, holy shit. I was like, amazing. I couldn't believe it. Wow. And and then did it change overnight it, for your business? Uh, Well, yeah. But then later it came out. And they still, Michelin being the amazing how they are, so stoic, they went along. And before they had the party, you used to get a phone call the day of the release. And they'd tell you, you got two stars, you got one star, you lost a star. And now they do the party instead so everybody goes to the party and this whole thing so they used to be even more mysterious than they are but uh it was a great thing i don't think mission was too happy when that whole leak came out and the whole thing happened and we found it after that but that was the entrance into la and then we had two stars from them we never had just one we started with two stars but again we were a restaurant that had been open for uh nine you know already eight or nine years I have a question. Is that a real background? Or no. Is that like a, no. I'm going to say it's pretty cool. Very yeah. uh, Don Draper looking little living room. Yeah, yeah. Total madman. You know, you and I talked about um, mid-century and design. Yep. And and I saw your Macintosh stereo. And I was over there just kind of putting on Miles Davis and stuff. And uh, hanging out with uh, Burr and his wife. And we are just having the best time in there. Eating the greatest food. It just felt like... Um, 
it just felt beyond to me. You just like just that that vibe, that little little room and great music and great food. It makes you sit down for a minute and go, you know what, man? This is all you need. And all the bullshit just wipes away. You're just in there, yeah. with friends, good food, good friends, and good music. And it's just a game changer for your mind. I agree. And that's not a typical fine dining Michelin style experience. It's totally like, like I said, when I opened Malice in 1999, I was 30 years old and I opened this fine dining restaurant. I was a young kid cooking for old people. Now I like to say I'm an old man and I have a restaurant for young people, right? Because, I mean, life changes, life evolves. And I had to say, what's next for fine dining? Because well, my grandfather used to tell me about when he lived in France, my friend, and how he'd go out to these restaurants of fine dining. They were nothing like when I started cooking in 30 years later. And then now we're here 35 years later, and I had to say, what's next for fine dining? What do I want fine dining to be? What does it mean to me? And I guess I felt at a time of putting so much in and it's, and, and and having established what I did, I could decide to what I want fine dining to be. And that's what Melise is. It's what I feel fine dining should be. Not traditionally what it was. I mean, in it, yes, we use the fine china. We create the the wine glasses, the whole idea of that part's traditional. But the music, the small intimacy, the artwork, the whole way we do it in there, is definitely what I feel fine dining for me should be now instead of what it was in the past where you have a little bit better time. Plus we're a lot more casual as a, as a, as a uh, what's the word I want to say. We're a lot more casual now as people, as a culture, our culture is way more casual. Society is more casual here in LA. So I just felt like I want to make this experience. It's totally different. And, and I think it worked out like, you know, took a risk with that but it worked out let me ask you um about growing up in la i know you're a big music head and um same as myself we talked to music were you going out to live shows a lot or were you uh cooking at night so you didn't get to go out you know a lot when I, before that i go to some shows you know at the roxy or like the music machine, go see the Untouchables, some of the local bands. You know, I see the Clash. The, you know, back in the day, the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium had some great concerts. Like I saw the Pretenders there. My first concert was this band called the Surf Punks. They're not that oh, great, I love but it was a cool. My wave, go <laughs> my wave. Yeah, I mean, they weren't the best them. band, but they were a fun band to watch, and it was a great concert. You know, but seeing the Clash there amazing like that was all one of my all-time favorite bands ever clash uh you know gotten to the mod ska kind of thing see the english beat you know the roxy the music machine uh the, the whiskey go to some events there but once i started cooking you know i work nights and that was pretty much my life you kind of give that up you know you you cook when other people have fun yeah the shows are over even when you get out 11 30 12 it's like too late the show's over i mean like i said you can go to a bar and then nothing good happens you're up you're up you're, you're wired and then it's like you're, you don't want to go to sleep la is not the best town fortunate enough la kind of forces you home not like new york <laughs> yeah right but yeah, yeah the music was always part of it i think my parents love music i've always loved music listening to music i just think it's part it makes life right it's like yeah, you want to have you want to have that soundtrack behind your life, right? You have to have that soundtrack playing in the background. Imagine it. And to me, it's just always like, you know, when you're having a shitty day, something's not right, you listen to music, you forget about that crap and you just kind of drift off into some good times. I wouldn't play anything that has bad memories, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, man. Music's funny too, because it could, if it's a song or something that reminds you of a bad time, a breakup or something like that, it could take you right back in that shit too, so very emotional music and i think that's what i like about it creates a lot of emotion it also uh sets a mood for a type of restaurant that i go to you know uh by going to a restaurant they're playing fine you know kick-ass music i know right away uh i'm going to be eating there more and more you know because there is that that thing where restaurants just don't care what they play and they're just pumping in like low techno or or house music or whatever. And after a while, it starts to get to you. Not like I'm some old man or whatever, but when I go into like, let's say Wolfgang Puck's Cut and they're playing Zeppelin, 
I'm well, like, exactly. That's that's what you want. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I make all my own playlists because to me, I need to have that playlist to recommend what I want. Like when I just opened this new charcoal on Sunset, you know, people, oh, you need a little more hip hop, R and B. So I made a playlist for R and B, but I went and I listened. To, I stayed up, got home, probably stayed up to like three thirty in the morning, and I just made went through this different R and B like playlists that were out there on Spotify. But I listen to every single song I put on there to make sure it fit what I want to have and make sure they had enough up and down, you know, enough stuff. I don't want to, I'm not going to put a bunch of, I don't want to have a lot of explicit language. Right. But I want to, I want want enough edge too. Like, you know, if there's an NWA song you can find that has just enough, you know, you put that on, but. Right. But yeah, I, I have to listen to it all. I have to hear it and make sure it's what fits to be on there. I do feel like L.A. has some uh, great steakhouses, you know, Boa Cut and now uh, Charcoal on Sunset. It's yeah. at the 9000 uh, building across the street from the Roxy. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. And that's a that's a famous building over the years of all kinds of stuff going on in there. That building is so famous. Everybody has someone who were either with their agent or worked there, accountant, lawyer. That building's like nuts. It is nuts. I went to meetings there early on uh, in L.A., you know, like that Ice Cube. I think he had his office in there and I did a movie with him. So I went to some meetings there and, uh, you know, it was always like the 9000 building. You knew right where you're going. Exactly. 9000 had that big yellow 9000 right in front. So it's yeah. kind of cool to be anchoring that off, getting that going. We just opened a few weeks ago. So. I'm going to go try it. I'm going to go see Neil Young at the Roxy. Yeah, 50th anniversary. Yeah, I'm going that night. And I want to go and eat a steak at your yeah, place and then definitely. walk across the street and see Neil Young. I don't think there's anything better than a kick-ass steak and Neil Young. Well, I think that's going to be pretty cool. Uh, he, he's gonna, It's going to be cool. I think that I think he played there 50 years ago. Right, right. Um, Tonight's the night. Yeah, I think that's the September 20th. Somewhere in September. It's coming yes, up. Yes, the 20th. Yeah. I'm I'm looking forward to that. Um, it's gonna be a good night there. Neil Young rocking out. Unbelievable. And you have charcoal in Santa Monica, right? Yeah, charcoal in Venice. Venice, okay. charcoal Venice. Right on the border of Marina Del Rey. Yeah. He's actually eaten there, Neil Young. Came in for his anniversary with Daryl Hannah. Wow. They've wow. eaten several times at Malise. They they they're, I believe they're vegetarian, so they like my restaurant. We always had a vegetarian menu at least in the old days. Let me ask you, why do you think that a good breakfast is almost impossible to get? I My favorite restaurant in L.A. Uh, is All Time in Los Feliz, and it, it serves one of the best breakfasts that I've ever had. Mama's in San Francisco, one of the best breakfasts on the planet. Uh, why do you think it's so hard to find a good breakfast? I don't like, I feel like there was better breakfast before. Yeah. I feel like back, like to me, I love good eggs, a thick ham and steak and some nice hash brown potatoes. You know, I love that breakfast. It's nice sourdough toast. I would always go to, um, uh, what's the name of this place? It's on Pico. Oh, I love this place. Uh, I, 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 can't remember the name. I go there with my daughter all the time. I, I got They open one in the valley too, but then it was on oh, Pico. Uh, blue, blue amp or blue. Uh, no, what's the name of this? Uh, I would go. I would go there before school with my daughter all the time. It was an Irish guy. He opened it years ago, uh, right by right before Rancho Park. Hmm. I don't know. Uh, what's the name of it? It was a great restaurant. Uh, it's gonna come to me. Is it gone? Yeah, it's great. It's still there. No, it's still there. They had great, great, like, you know, country biscuits, and they, their food was awesome. Well, I, the name is killing me. They always had a great breakfast. Maxwell's, it's on Washington. Oh, yeah. Um, that used to have the best huevos rancheros back in the day, like, you know, in the 80s and 90s. They, they stole it off. But I just think breakfast has gotten different now. People don't eat the same way breakfast. Those greasy spoons that had that great breakfast are kind of like, you know, yeah. disappearing. Like there was a place called Cora's Coffee Shop. It's right there where Cora's is, where Capo is, right on uh, Ocean a- Ocean Avenue in Santa Monica. 
This guy, Ernie, ran it. It had a counter. You'd walk in, and he did these omelets. You'd flip them right there and do them. We had these sandwiches, the ham killer sandwich. It was, like, still good. The melted cheese on the ham, the fried egg, the white bread, just done right there and handed to you. So, it was, oh, it was great. So, breakfast, I think, is I don't eat breakfast anymore. So, I think it's died off. I don't know. A lot oh, of people don't to do it. Maybe the younger generation don't know how to cook it. It all got to be avocado toast and this and some fermented greens and are having this like little berry bowl. I mean, I'll tell you what. See, mm -hmm. it's all fine, but that's different than the old breakfast where you have the perfectly cooked egg and you have that great thick cut toast and you stop that up. Ah, it's delicious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you got to go to all time with me and we'll have like a brunch. Or yeah, I've never been there. I gotta check it out. Man, I don't make it to Silver Lake too often. That's in Los Feliz, but Los Feliz, same difference. Silver Lake, think, Los Feliz. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I get it. I need a passport to get there. Yeah, I know, man. When you live on the other side of town, you might as well live in San Diego. You know, an hour and twenty minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah the breakfast. I mean, it, to me, I like a clean breakfast because uh, I eat pretty clean in the last seven years. So I like like a kick ass overnight oats. I like a super clean omelet with great uh, eggs, you know, really good eggs. I love an amazing breakfast quesadilla. Uh, those are the best. I love breakfast quesadillas. I quesadilla. like omelets, but they got to be French style omelets made, you know, with good ingredients, soft, beautifully fluffed up. I love it. I love it. You know, it's hard to find a good breakfast in L.A. It's really wild. And I'm not talking about like a truck because I'm going to get a lot of DMs. Oh, you ought to try this. It's like trucker style places. There's a million of those, you know, where they have like they got pancakes. They're 16 feet high and and they put like uh, candy bars in them. And, uh, you know, it's like I'm not talking about that shit. I'm talking about a clean fucking breakfast like Farmer's Daughter, like in Lower East Side, New York, stuff like that. Yeah, but John O'Groats, that's what I was talking about. They had a good breakfast. John O'Groats on Pico. Oh, man. That's good, too. They had, I like their breakfast. Like I said, I always like thick cut ham and eggs. That was my go-to for breakfast. What, what else I, has good breakfast? I mean, I grew up eating at this place called Thomas's Coffee Shop. It was on Lincoln, and it wasn't the best breakfast, but it was home. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, steak yeah. and eggs, steak and eggs and hash browns. Oh, yeah. That, that was me every night. Mel's on Geary in San Francisco. They're open all night. I get steak yeah. and eggs at three in the morning after playing music. Like <laughs> steak and eggs and an espresso bean shake. The best, right? But I mean, that New York used to have all those great, great, like, oh, yeah, coffee shops on every corner, like, you know, Seinfeld coffee shop there. Yeah, yeah, those are great. Sam Fran just lost a great one a couple of years ago. It was in the Castro called Sparky's. It was open for, I don't know, 30 years. It was one of the great, great breakfasts, you know? Oh, my God. Yeah. But Mama's is the best, uh, hands down, in San Fran. And it's got a mile-long line, which sucks, you know? These mile-long yeah. lines when it's good. Oh, it makes me nuts. Yeah, it's hard to cook the right good breakfast, I guess, you know? Yeah, yeah. Maybe next time, uh, your next restaurant will be a kick-ass breakfast place. Yeah, but then you got to go to work in the morning when people call in sick. That sucks. <laughs> we do a kick-ass brunch at Charcoal. We were doing it on Saturdays and Sundays, but we didn't get enough business. We closed the one in Venice. I'm going to give it a shot on uh, in, 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 in Sunset, trying to open for brunch, and I want to do, like, I want to do a uh, DJ or something fun, do something, I don't know. I'll go, Try man. When are you going to start it? And hopefully in the next four weeks, I got to get the staff in and get it going. I got to push them. You text me and I'll come out and we'll uh, right. we'll eat some brunch there. For sure. Sounds awesome. It's a good uh, brunch. The food is great. I can't thank you enough for talking to me, man. I, I really enjoyed your restaurant and, and you as a human, I thought was just fantastic. I was like, oh, I got to have them on the show. I, I, I'm always mystified by people that have restaurants that are open 10, 15, 20 years. And you just walk by and you go, man, that guy's been there for like 30 years. That is like a full win in the restaurant business. Yeah, it's a long time. You got to keep yeah. inventing yourself. You got to keep seeing what's next, what's next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, man. And uh, awesome. you got to here some comedy. I got to check it out. What do you usually at the comedy show? Where do you usually go? 
I'm at the comedy store all the time, man. I'm there. Uh, the guy came in. It's just so down the street from Charcoal. What's his name? What a manager came in for dinner one night. Richie. Richie. He's yeah. coming back east, right? Yeah. Back east guy. Yeah, he came in. Told me uh, he enjoyed it. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, uh, awesome. I'll come down. Are you at Charcoal at all? Lately, I've been there almost every night. Oh, I'll come off. in. When, are you going to be there this week? I'll come eat. I'll be, I'll, yeah, I was, let's see, I was, I'll be there Friday night. Tonight, I got to be there in the evening, and then Saturday, I have a big catering party, so I won't be there. All right. I'll come Sorry, in Thursday. Friday night. All right, I'll be there. Oh, man, I'm looking forward to, I, I love the name Charcoal, man. It just yeah, I like it. When I was a kid, man, you'd go down to the grocery store, and you'd buy those charcoal briquettes in the bag with that chef yep. on, the, on the cover of it. Remember that? What was that brand? Uh, I don't remember. Briquette, uh, yeah, it's just charcoal. Or whatever. To me, charcoal, you're talking about the red and white bag. And red, yeah, that's blue it. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. The only bag they had back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You couldn't exactly. get all these other good stuff. You just get the briquettes. That's what you got. You went to the grocery store and you get, you say, pick up a six pack and a bag of charcoal yep. briquettes. Throw it in that Weber, get it going. Yeah, you got the fucking Weber burning your finger on the vents. Ah, fuck. Yep, yep. It's all good. Best oh way to my cook. God, man. How do you do the, uh, how do you cook the uh, steaks there now? Is it wood? Or? On charcoal, all over charcoal. Wow. On an open grill, yeah. Beautiful. Wow. But we, use the, we don't use the briquettes anymore. We use the, uh, you know, organic oak, you know, beautiful charcoal. Yeah. Nice flavor, not too strong. All right. Love it. I'm going to come down there and follow. We got ribs, steaks. What do you got? We got steaks. We got some lamb ribs that are killer. We got fish. Everything's cooked over charcoal from the veggies, so it has a lot of flavor and deliciousness. Really global place. You'll like it. I'm looking forward Not to it. Not your typical steakhouse. It's totally different. Good for vegetarians, too. Okay. I'm on it. Thank you so much right. for uh, being awesome. on the show. And I'm looking forward to seeing you at the restaurant. Come down and see some comedy. I look forward to it. Enjoy Thank you, it, my man. All right. Thanks a lot. I'll Cheers you, to that. Later.